Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fierceness of the Mother Global Conference. In this space, we will be gathering for powerful conversations with both women and men to reveal and restore the ancient feminine ways of knowing. This event is designed to open up space for all of us to reinstate the principle of the continuance of life as our top priority. Here you are invited to tune into the guidance from the feminine force of creation and learn how this force can be used to revolutionize and revitalize our world. So I am your host, Jocelyn Mercado, and I am honored today to be here with Cater Brown. Welcome, Cater. Thank you so much. For thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. It's great to be here. It's an honor. Yeah, thank you so much. And so let me introduce you to everybody here. Cater Brown is an internationally known ceremonialist and Cal Shell diviner, a healer, intuitive, and teacher of psychological and spiritual awareness with over 35 years of professional experience. Over this time, Cater has developed an effective and unique approach to emotional and spiritual healing by braiding together his in-depth knowledge or his depth of clinical knowledge of experiential psychotherapies with more nature-based indigenous wisdom teachings and ritual healing methods from around the world. Cater is the founder and director of Rites of Passage Council an organization offering nature-based treatment and professional training programs. Cater is a member of an International Wilderness uh, Guides Council and known for his ability to blend many creative and expressive forms of depth psychology and therapy with more ancient methods of healing through vision quest ceremonies, wet lodge ceremonies, rites of passage experiences, and personalized ceremonies and rituals in his work with individuals, couples, groups, and communities. Cater lives in the highlands of Western North Carolina. It's a beautiful place there. And so I am very excited about your topic today, Cater, the road ahead and the indigenous heart. So could you begin by sharing with us what, what does the, the fierceness of the mother evoke for you? What, what words or images does that bring up for you? Images, images. Um, you know, the, the, uh, funny right now because i tend to just go with the threads of awareness that are coming um, i have two grown daughters and um, both powerful young women um, and uh, so as a, a father of daughters um, i have a real desire to to uh, be a part of a world that's awakening this energy and supporting this energy um, Images like the ones you put on the screen of the the, the tiger and uh, images of the planet, um, images of these these global climactic uh, transformational disruptions that are happening all over the planet. Um, those kind of images comes to mind. The way that uh, um, when I think of the the fierceness of the mother as as the earth. Um, in my way of thinking, I tend not to, what I would say, anthropomorphize uh, Gaia, Earth, um, but look at it's simply a matter of balance, you know, that the, the Earth works to rebalance herself and will do that through any number of experiences and means uh, that she has. And um, so we experience these on our end as often these natural disasters. Um, and uh, so I'm also aware of this, that our relationship to Earth is so disconnected um, in terms of connection to what I would call the deep listening and receptivity and, and uh, perceptivity of the feminine. Um, so when I think about what is the, the powerful energies of the feminine that are being called forth, that there's a, a clear perceptive knowing and a deep listening um, to what is happening out there. And when I hear the, even the title, the fierceness of the mother, uh, when I think of that energy, it, it, it's like it's saying, that's an, it's enough, stop. Um, and so it, it, that energy really halts um, our human behavior, our, our ways of doing things that are out of balance. Um, 
And then after that, after that fierceness sets a clear boundary and says, stop, this is enough. Um, then how do we find our way back? That's, that's my bigger question. How do we find our way back to uh, that kind of deep listening, um, that kind of relationship? Um, I love it that you're sitting out there in the natural world um, doing this webinar. And um, so this way of opening our hearts and our minds to, to deeper listening, to deeper presence. Um, as, a, as a ritualist and a ceremonialist, um, I think of earth in a couple of ways. I think of the uh, spirit of the earth as an energy, as a teacher that, in, that instructs and guides us. And I also think of the elemental ancestor of earth as a medicinal uh, elemental response to the chaos that's happening. Um, so when, uh, in part of my uh, work with people, we sometimes will do earth rituals. And, uh, and what kind of situations uh, create a need for an earth ritual? Well, things, a, a disconnection, sense of homelessness, uh, uh, lack of belonging in our own skin, uh, let alone our community and our environment, um, losing connection to our own own belonging, our own way of belonging to ourselves. Um, my passion, uh, aside from other things over the past 35 years, has been in doing rites of passage, which is all about bringing the people back home to the memory of who they are um, and what they're here to offer. And that kind of alignment uh, with, uh, with the medicine that you came into this world to offer um, is a way of uh, uh, belonging and connecting with earth. It's like, where do I stand? You know, what is my place? That's, that's, that's connection with earth. Um, sense of presence. Um, how we hold presence or the power of presence. That's, that's earth energy and how we carry it in our bodies. Um, so my mind takes off into images of, of different earth ritual prescriptions and experiences that I've had with people of uh, everything where people are literally buried into the earth, um, can still breathe for a period of time in ceremony, um, or having earth placed on you um, is another more gentler way of connecting with earth. Um, but this ways of, of uh, sensorily connecting back in with this energy, with this being we call Earth on a very personal level. Um, you know, and, and uh, one other thing that comes to mind in terms of the elements, um, when we think about fire and water and Earth or mineral, nature, air, um, and, and a lot of indigenous um, creation stories. Uh, the, the first element out of the void or out of the great dreaming is fire. And the second element is ice or water. And these two uh, great ancestral elements uh, produce the third, which is earth. Um, and so it's uh, uh, connecting back to our elemental blueprint. Um, through direct contact with nature, with earth, with fire, with water. Um, these, these things begin to, to balance us. You know, when you, um, in our modern culture, when you're feeling some disruption of your own being emotionally or physically, and you go to the, the Western, Western medicine, um, and they prescribe something, and, it, and what they prescribe is some medication. You go down to the store and you pick it up and you look at the bottle and it says active ingredients. And there'll be something, some long word we usually can't pronounce. <laughs> um, and that's what gives the, the medicine its, its power. Um, so for indigenous cultures and in ritual, the active ingredients to healing are the elements. And earth is one of those elemental uh, beings and, and uh, and medicines 
that restores us to, to who we are. Um, so there's a few things that get, get stirred up when we, with that. Yeah, thank you for, for these beautiful images and beautiful um, beginning glimpses of some of the, the work that you do with people. It's really, really wonderful. And I love the image of the earth that's behind you. I don't know if you always have that there, but it's so fitting and perfect for, for our topic here today. So. Yeah, this, this is uh, our group room down in our house. So it sits there all the time. I don't actually get to sit here in front of it all the time, but I thought it was fitting to, to bring myself out here in front of the earth and the ancestors. Yes. Um, since that's so much a part of the same story we're talking about. Yeah, um, I, I was um, especially moved by, uh, I was moved by a lot of it, but one thing in particular that you said really stood out to me, and that was that, you know, the earth is, is showing her fierceness in these natural events that are occurring, that we call natural mm -hmm. events. Right? And so I wonder what, what are your your deeper thoughts on that but, you know um because i feel that she she's getting more fierce she's having to give us these more and more strong warning signals mm -hmm. um, so yeah what are your thoughts on that well it, it it comes my judgment is that it comes from uh living in a paradigm of scarcity um so if we back up the story, and, and there's a lot of stories that are out there as like, how did humans uh, go astray? You know, how did they forget the original language? And what was that original language when we all communicated? That one that didn't involve words. Um, that one that does involve that feminine uh, deep listening, deep perceptivity. Uh, that language before words, that language of, of the kind of the ears of our heart, the words of our heart. So going back to that time when there was this uh, connection. And then in a lot of the creation stories and a lot of indigenous stories, you'll hear something where the humans did something and went down a different path. Well, you'll hear that there was a, a shift in the, the uh, uh, global magnetic fields of the planet and the birth of agriculturalism and stopping and planting rather than being nomadic and that whole process of stopping and planting creates a whole separation and competition model for survival um, so whatever the reasons we, we began to disconnect um, it, that that original separation um, creates a sense of scarcity because then we start living out of balance. One of my native teachers one time uh, uh, said that, you know, was, was sharing with me about scarcity is the great illusion that goes on on this planet. But it's only precipitated because we live out of balance. That when you live in balance, there is no scarcity. Um, so this process of uh, how do we bring ourselves back in alignment uh, and, and in balance uh, with with the earth, with these natural rhythms, um, cycles, um, so that it restores a sense of, of balance. And, and the whole paradigm of scarcity um, begins to shift to a new model. Because scarcity produces that better and less, what I call better and less than thinking, which is meaning that when you're born into this world, uh, given your particular aptitude and your interests that you develop, uh, we'll give you a list of uh, occupational uh, occupations to choose from. When you have an occupational handbook, you can go through it and pick something. Um, in an indigenous model, it would be a different uh, way of thinking because in that way of thinking, um, you can be better or you can be less than somebody else. In the other way of thinking, um, you would come to this world having made agreements with certain ancestors about this gift that you're bringing here. You say, they need this down there. I want to bring this. And so you make agreements and form alliances with those that carry that same medicine in that world. And you come here uh, to deliver that gift. Um, and 
that way you, you can't be better the same way you can't be less. You can only be you or not you. And so it's a whole different paradigm um, that is, uh, spins a new story of connection, uh, of deepening relationship. Um, you know, it always amazes me that technologically we have these things that call, we call connection technology. And they actually do everything but that. Uh, what they do is they help us speed up, um, <clears throat> but it doesn't really help connect. It just creates, it makes things go faster. Um, and so this idea of slowing down, uh, again, I like, uh, love the image of you sitting in nature. There's just this process of slowing down until all of the uh, noise in my, in my head begins to quiet. And sometimes it takes a few days of sitting in nature, being still. For that to happen um, and sometimes there's some doorways of grief or anger that I have to go through in order for that to happen um, but that slowing down and becoming still and letting that stuff rise up um, and then on the other side of that uh, we start to remember and be aware of that what I call the original language of uh, of the which is much more of a feminine way of perceiving and knowing and listening from my perspective. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, yes, this is very interesting. We had a, another speaker offer, you know, ideas about where do humans go wrong and it's, it's very <clears throat> fascinating subject to. Uh, <laughs> it, it is, I mean, there, there's plenty of arguments, you know, across the borders on where we went wrong and how that happened. Yeah. Or even if we even did, there's that, that, you know, nothing, nothing really happened. <laughs> there's that story that's out there. <clears throat> and when I thought about the reason I like the, the, the title that I use, and I use this for some workshops, the, uh, the road ahead in the indigenous heart. <clears throat> Cause if I say, if, if you and I are walking down this road and one thing we, that both you and I know is that somewhere down there, one of us is going to leave. One of us is going to die first. Uh, that's that's not uh, disputable. That's going to happen. So the question then for me is, how do we walk this road together? Not even how much did we, so much did we get here, um, or what's really going to happen. We know what's going to happen. <laughs> um, but how do we walk this road in a good way with each other? Um, and so then it comes to the simple things. You know, when we look at what what could I possibly do, it's it's like well, if we're all walking each other, as as Ram Dass says, walking each other home is really all that we're really doing. How do we walk this road? And and how do we uh, encourage support in each other to bring all that they came here to bring as we walk together? Um, so in that in that old way of seeing death as our ally. You know, and not not pretending uh, or getting caught in the stories of what's going to happen, um, because it's a good way to avoid uh, my responsibility to right now. Um, I can put a lot of energy in that fight, <clears throat> and already know what's going to happen. You know, <clears throat> I'm going to leave this planet. Everybody else is going to leave. Uh, humans in general as a species come, you know, we may come and go like species do. <clears throat> so that's a certainty. Um, <clears throat> so it's more of like, again, how do we, how do we walk this road together with hearts, um, with focus? Um, those are the questions that, that I have. Um, yeah, this is and uh, so I'll, let me pause there. <laughs> Yes, this is very powerful. Um, that that uh, image of yeah, yeah, we're walking this road together, and one of us has to leave first. So how how can we best walk this road together in harmony? Mm -hmm. and, um, it's really really powerful. I I wonder if you could share more with us about um, seeing death as our ally. I know that you have some really beautiful. Mm -hmm rituals and ceremonies that you share around this um i think it's something so important because we're we're very uh we, we tend to be very afraid to embrace death and to see it as an Ryan. 
Well, I will um, share more personal stories around that. Um, uh, growing up, my mother worked for hospice. And um, in my first internships as I was uh, getting out of graduate school and psychology and all that were in, you know, and working with hospice patients. Closer to home than that is that in March, um, my mother uh, died and under the care of hospice. She was 93 years old, right? three, year, three years old. And truly I could say this, this is one that lived well and died well. Um, in the last couple of years bef before her death, she would come to visit us and she would stay downstairs in the, um, in the downstairs bedroom. And each morning I'd wake up and I knew about what time she'd walk to the bottom of the stairs and I would hear my name said, Kater. And I would get up and I would walk down the steps and I'd greet her at the bottom of the steps and I'd say, you know, morning, mom. And I'd take her by the arm. And we'd start to walk those 13 steps. And as we walked, you know, every two, three, she'd need to pause and get her breath, but she loved to talk and she would tell me stories. And so she even talked about, you know, I, I think I'd like to, I think this will be the year that I, that I, that I go. Um, I think I'd like to die like your dad did, like with all of the family around us and, and just kind of slip away in my sleep. Um, this was two months before she actually choreographed that very way of dying. Um, but in those walks, in those what I call 13 steps of walking, uh, and, and the thing she would say that what she taught me in her dying and her grace of how she approached her death um, was about the simple things. You know, the, um, the sounds of those birds that are around you. You know, when I wake up in the morning at, and I hear the birds at sunrise, um, you know, I think of my mom and, and because she loved that. She actually died at, at, at sunrise with birds chirp coming in the, bird sounds coming in the window. And so she taught me that it's, you know, the simple things as, as she got older, um, those were the powerful things. Um, you know, a good cup of coffee. <laughs> um, kindness to everyone. And uh, prayer. She was very... Uh, she was a devout Catholic, but, but a much more expanded version of what some may think of as Catholicism these days. Um, but just very kind hearted. I would definitely say that she was, the way she walked uh, that road in her final years was just with a deep compassion, with kindness, with care, um, forgiveness, understanding, and really a lot of gratitude. Gratitude for the for very simple things that we often overlook. Um, I think in our culture we're, we're used to a lot of stimulation, so what we seek in order to experience something of, that helps us feel alive is an extra dose of stimulation, more than the usual. So then we feel this aliveness. Um, but what I learned in, in the way that she walked with death is that there was this slowing down, and that. Um, that everything uh, came alive. The, the, the warmth of the sun on her face, uh, the hummingbird that would come visit when she would sit on the porch. I mean, she, she would marvel at these things as miracles. And I would try and you know, look at these things as she's looking at them, realizing that she's got death right beside her. Um, and really we all do, we just don't know it. Um, and so I think this this way of Walking that road with gratitude, uh, with with a much more expanded awareness, to slow down our nervous systems, um, you know, to let go of some of the old stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves, so that we can be more present to what's in front of us, or or old stories we tell ourselves about other people that we've been telling, and we trap them in stories that they don't belong in anymore, and. And that stops us from seeing the mystery of who, who another is in front of us. Um, I definitely say I learned that from her. This, this uh, walking with death as your ally. It teaches you how to live 
that's really the thing I notice. That when you uh, befriend your own death, you learn how to uh, live with with uh, compassion, with fierce love, with uh, without apology. Um, and uh, it's it's a beautiful thing. Um, this walking with death as an ally. Um, and all the aliveness that, that the earth and the planet has to offer, all of a sudden it's, it's like it shows up and it's been there all along. We just haven't seen it. Yeah, thank you. That was very moving, very, very moving story. Um, well, I, I wonder if you could share with us, um, I know you, you have spoken about the power of the feminine to awaken us to a more soul centric and egocentric approach. Eco, not ego. <laughs> centric, right. you know, approach and response to to what the world needs. Could you could you share a little bit more about that? How can the feminine help us in that? Yeah, I, I, I first heard those words from a friend of mine, Bill Plotkin, who some of you out there probably know Bill's work, and and so. Um, he stresses the egocentric versus the ecocentric model of human being and, and then the soul centric. Um, so that what becomes center to our focus is a, uh, a relationship of belonging. So when you say ecocentric, um, that community all of a sudden uh, expands beyond the, the uh, regular definitions of humans um, to not just human community, but human and non-human um, community. So that we have a sense of uh, greater belonging to this, this wider community. Um, so it becomes, uh, I think, you know, as I get older, this eco-centered or eco-centric and soul-centric awareness of um, that we do belong we're not we're not uh, even though we have been living as living uh, often as aliens in a place where we should belong um, there is a sense that uh, the truth being that we do belong in this in this uh, in this world in this nature we are part of it we are we are literally part of the dreaming of the earth and the dreaming of the ancestors um, and so uh, this this eco, eco centric and soul centric model is an expansion of awareness and and deepening of relationship. Um, but but I think I, I, my my strong sense is it requires a slowing down, slowing down. Where um, again I, I noticed all the things we tend to create just enable us to go faster. They don't enable us to connect deeper. Um, because we're in this often get caught in a manic kind of addictive cycles of, of looking for home, looking for belonging through experiences that are quite elusive. Um, and these kind of belongs in, belonging that I'm talking about is kind of eco-centered and, and soul-centric way of uh, being are not, they, they can't be acquired through destinations or acquisitions. Um, that's the trappings of our of our culture is that there's there's going to be some destination or some acquisition that will all of a sudden uh, make everything come into place and um, it just doesn't happen that way um, you know think about the I love one of the old uh, Carlos Castaneda teachings I have to pull one of those out of the out of my memory bank when he's when he tells um, Don Juan tells Kastner, he says, you know, there are a million paths you can follow. And, uh, and the thing about all these paths is they all go nowhere. They all go nowhere. But there, there'll be a path of heart or a path that has a heart and paths that don't have a heart. And so that's really the important choice. And that, that brings me back to the whole concept of the, the road ahead and the indigenous heart is that are you walking a path that has a heart or are you not? The destination, don't worry, it doesn't go anywhere. There is not a destination. We just die at the end of this road and we go somewhere else and that's it. But does the path have heart now, the one I'm walking? Um, so those are things that, that your question stimulates. 
Yeah, thank you for sharing those. I wonder about, um, could you tell us more about how we are, we're a part of the dreaming of the earth and the dreaming of the universe? So we are, um, elementally, we'll, we're made up of the same cosmic stardust and planetary minerals um, as everything else. <clears throat> and um, if you go back, this is the way I think about it. If, if, if you and I could turn and walk back down your lineage or just pick one of the four major lines and we just went for a stroll back, 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 back to your distant ancient ancestors, we would come to a time and a place where there was very little differentiation between the person and the environment they lived in. Uh, they would know it intimately and that, and that, uh, and that land would know them intimately. The birds would know you, the animals would know you. And there was, there was that kind of uh, connection. And, um, and so this idea that we have, uh, uh, by some uh, stories of, of origin, that the dreaming of the earth has brought everything into the physical realm, into being. Um, and we are part of that dreaming. Um, and also, we therefore hold the responsibility uh, reciprocally to redream the earth. There's an old uh, Irish uh, proverb that I, that I like that says that the troubles in the other world can only be healed from this world. And the troubles in this world can only be healed from the other world. And so it implies this reciprocal relationship of care. Um, and that other world being also the earth, you know, that we're reciprocally responsible for redreaming uh, the earth itself as we have been dreamed into this place by our ancestors, by the stories they lived. Um, and to feel the pull of our, you know, our great grandchildren and our great great grandchildren, um, that uh, if we step into um, the new physics for a moment, where there is no past or future, there's just, it's just all now. Um, then imagine for a moment, and I would ask uh, those listening um, to imagine. And uh, in say five seconds of my being quiet here, imagine your great great grandchildren are praying to their ancestors. And are you listening? And to think about that. And what are those prayers? What is it that we will leave leave behind? We came into this world to deliver a gift in who we are and what we came here to do. And, and, um, and so we want to leave that gift. We want to leave that medicine in the ground so that, you know, my great, great grandchildren one day can dig that medicine up and it would be useful. Um, so it's a, I think it's an important thing that often when we look back to the indigenous ways of being and and for guidance, um, to think forward and imagine our great great grandchildren looking right now um, to us. How will we respond? Yeah. Yes. This is quite profound. Quite profound. Um, and I, I encourage everybody. I, I feel I'm going to do that as a more extended practice later on, right? When I have a little more time, I encourage anybody mm -hmm. else to do that who feels called because that, that feels really, really powerful. And I would, I would offer, I wanted to offer where we are in time, but I wanted to offer um, a ritual prescription in terms of earth. <clears throat> That'd be wonderful. And that is to um, uh, find a particular time of day, um, that speaks to you. I personally like the those liminal times, that that time around sunrise or time around sunset, <clears throat> where there's a, a a thinness between the worlds or a feeling of 
where the other world feels close. Um, and if you're in a place uh, where, there, where you have easy access to earth, um, to just go out and connect with the earth, walk on the earth, put your hands in the earth, um, and offer um, a moment of, of gratitude for what the earth offers us in, in, you know, in clean water and, and in food and, and in nourishment and in grounding and belonging and place and home <clears throat> and all these things that, that the earth offers and just to offer some gratitude back. Maybe uh, pour some milk and honey on the ground as an offering or, or leave some flowers, just to have a connection, but to feel it, let it feel. And if you don't live in a place where you can easily access nature, but you can go down to the, uh, uh, the Lowe's or hardware store and get some, some topsoil and bring it into your home, bring it into your apartment and put it in a bowl. And, um, and just so that you have a sense of presence and connection with earth. Um, and to do this uh, every day, um, let's say for 90 days. <clears throat> now, um, if you're not able to do that, you know, we travel, we go places, we don't have our bowl of earth with us on the airplane or, or wherever we're doing, or we're not in the woods uh, all the time. What I would suggest to is simply close your eyes at that same time of day when possible and send your spirit to that experience and do that thing in that way, just to walk through it. It's a very powerful practice. Um, and that way you can always connect in. Um, and the other part is once you connect in to listen, to let at least uh, a part of the time that you're connecting with earth, uh, listen, listen. Um, and then of course there are, there are much more radical involved earth rituals, but these are simple things um, that don't require being buried in the earth. Um. <laughs> Which is a little more daunting. Yeah, it's powerful, but you know, if you don't have access to that, you don't need to wait until you do. Yeah, yes, thank you for that. I can see that over the 90 days that reciprocal relationship would, would become very, very strong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Well, I, there's one more question that I, I want to ask you before we open it up for the audience to ask some questions. And if the light is a little funny on you here, so I think the sun's coming through at a special angle right now. <laughs> um, but we, you know, we live in this, when we talk about masculine and feminine, mm -hmm. it can be very polarizing at times, right? We, mm -hmm. we live in this time where sometimes, you know, we're, we're not seeing things in the most cooperative way. Right. And so in speaking and making this event about the feminine, I certainly never, I do not, don't ever want to exclude the masculine. It's about bringing in these feminine ways, but in a way to empower both masculine and feminine. But I wonder, you know, as a shamanic practitioner and as a ceremonial host as you are, you know, how can we, how can we activate evolutionary change by tuning into the feminine in a way that, that really honors all of yeah, I'm really, I'm really glad you brought that up because that that tend to that tendency to polarize uh, a response, um, and that actually in many indigenous cultures they had a masculine ex, uh, energy and a feminine aspect of the earth, um, and uh, rites of passage since that's uh, my background of, of rites of passage initiations and, and vision quests. Um, that some of the uh, initiatory rites of passage, and I think this is a big part of what's happening in, in, in terms of the, uh, that we live in what, what might be called the fire culture. There's way too much fire. There's way too much uh, uninitiated masculine energy uh, running loose. And I differentiate that by calling it uninitiated masculine energy. So that in the, uh, the context of initiation, uh, even particularly for men, the idea that the young man would be severed from his mother 
and symbolically that umbilical cord would be severed. And then his quest, his time in nature was to uh, reconnect him to the greater mother, literally, so that he became a servant of, the feminine servant of uh, the, the earth. And so this, um, this initiatory passage, I could say certainly that's been missing for men, literally was to separate them from their, their boyhood uh, way of being, what I call the uninitiated masculine, and reconnect them to the deeper feminine of earth and of nature so that they become a servant of, and so that their masculine energy becomes in service to and in protection of that energy. Um, and so it's uh, a missing component in our culture. Um, and with the, uh, uh, with the energies of, uh, and this is a new pondering I've just come to, and I'm glad you brought it up, the energies of masculine and feminine. And, and, um, and we've gone through uh, awakening and acceptance of, of um, the gay and lesbian cultures and, and, and all these. And now we're moving into this zone of neither, mm -hmm. of uh, they, them, theirs identification, where one is not identified. And I would think about that. And I would think, you know, what on a much more global mythological scale, what's happening here? And I would think, well, to take the position of neither is the great dreaming. That's the void. That's the thing that happens before the new thing happens. Um, you know, it's the new moon where it's, it's, not, where it's not visible. It's not masculine. It's not feminine. There is, there's a potentiality of energy and dreaming uh, that I believe in a way that, that these folks are even carrying on a much more archetypal global level. And that kind of unidentified dreaming uh, is, is a reconnection to, to that original <coughs> great, <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> kind of the, the great dreaming of something new. <coughs> Wow. Yeah, I think get all excited yeah, about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the the universe is saying this point is very important. Pay attention. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> we tend to reduce things, <clears throat> and we lose <clears throat> um, lose the uh, <clears throat> let's say lose. <clears throat> the mythological context when we start reducing things like that. Yes. <clears throat> this this it gave me chills when you <clears throat> said this, when you, you, you said this, you know, not, not, you know, choosing to not be masculine or feminine, <clears throat> be neither. <clears throat> that that is like the new moon. That is like the void. That is like the right. <clears throat> gestation space. Of <clears throat> Really, right really and and you and we know that the <clears> that the way we used to measure <clears throat> the progression of, of seasons <clears throat> was with the night with the feminine with the dark it wasn't the it, the day wasn't the beginning <clears throat> the um the new year didn't begin around the winter solstice it actually began in indigenous cultures, it begins at the end. It, it's Samhain. It, it, you know, October 31st, November. It's and what what is happening <clears throat> is that we're entering the dark time. You know, from there to the winter solstice, we're in the deep dreaming. That's the dark, the dark side, and that's that's where the the dreaming uh, produces what does come. You know, when we talk about elements, <clears throat> out of the great dream uh, came Grandfather Fire. And out of the great dream came Grandmother Ice. <clears throat> and together, these two elements produced the rest of the story. Um, and now we're being carried back <clears throat> to the great dream um, and asked to hold, uh, hold the energy, hold the opposites. Um, and, and, uh, and be able to sit with it so that something does emerge. 
not to rush, not to push, not to not to name something too soon. Um, <clears throat> it's um, it, it's there's a practice I do with with some of my uh, apprentices that I call no naming. So I want you to to walk into nature and forget the names of things, um, <clears throat> and encounter them at a just a perceptual experiential level, as if you you don't have a name, and and what happens is we're held in a in a relational interaction with this being that we don't have a name for. Uh, the moment we name something, we step a little bit further back. If we categorize it, we step way back. Um, but to enter enter into relationship to that place of of wonder and curiosity, where uh, the language before names, um, and I think that's that's part of. Uh, I think that's part of this time we're moving in. Is what what will we bring out of this new great dreaming? That once the earth says stop, that's enough. What then follows? And will we be a part of that new dream? Us humans, I mean. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much cater for all you have shared so far and i am sure that our listeners have some wonderful questions for you as well um are you do you need to get more water thing i want to give you space if you need to uh, i feel like i'm recovering now i was got all excited there for a moment <laughs> yeah like i said it, it seems like you know when things like that happen <clears throat> pay attention this is important yeah <laughs> Well, as, so before we go to the Q&A, though, I want to let everybody know about Cater's free gift <clears throat> offering. So um, he's, well, I'll let you, I'll let you say more about it, but it's a, it's a, an audio story of the initiatory journey mm -hmm. and a chance to win a divinity <clears throat> reading with you. So. All right. So if you, um, if you sign up to our newsletter, <clears throat> you get an automatic um, download of the of the a story of the initiatory journey called Singing Stone. Um, it's a story I tell using the drum <clears throat> and it just speaks of the initiatory journey and finding our way back home to ourselves. And then from that list of people that sign up and I usually give it a couple of weeks around either side of the of the um, of this presentation. Um, and then from that list I'll draw uh, four names. Um, randomly from that list and offer you a free 30-minute um, uh, cowrie shell divination, which is done just like this. Um, we'll set up a time to um, meet online like this and, and do the divination that way. <clears throat> and of course, if you're interested, if you go to the website and interested in any of the other um, program offerings, um, just let me know that you um, saw heard you know learned about it here and i'll gladly offer you another 10 percent off of whatever the program is that's happening that you're interested in wonderful thank you <clears throat> generous offers much appreciated oh, you're welcome so if anybody has a question for cater uh, <clears throat> there are a few ways you can ask that one is that you can raise your hand and <clears throat> raise your hand, then I will bring you over either with video on or if you prefer, you can turn your video off from the audio only. And if you would like to, you can um, just put your question in the chat and I'll read it from there. So go ahead and submit your questions or raise your hand. Uh, we do have a question from Simone in the Q&A box here. She says, can you give us suggestions for how we can connect with the ancestors and the earth specifically about connecting with their dream or vision of us? Um, so connecting with the ancestors, um, and, and I'll include that this response as far as connecting with the earth, is um, you can think of your, your, yourself as having four primary lines of ancestral lineage. You know, so your, your mother's 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 line, your father's 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 line, and then to switch over your father's mother's line and your mother's father's line. <clears throat> so in, in indigenous cultures, 
where there used to be grief rituals and ancestralization rituals and ways of really ushering the dead home so that they got to where they needed to go. Um, often that hasn't happened. Um, and so there's a lot of unrest. You know, that, that phrase I said about the troubles in the other world can only be healed from this world and vice versa. That there's, um, <clears throat> as, I, as I tell people, being dead does not make one an ancestor no more than being uh, alive makes one healthy and conscious and well. <clears throat> that there's a whole area of turmoil that cycles between the un, those the, the unwell dead and the unwell living. And so first keep that in mind. So when we're going to connect with ancestors, you're going back, way, way back. And um, <clears throat> I would, uh, um, if you're familiar with how to do those kind of journeys, there is a process of journeying uh, where you would journey down your ancestral line to connect with uh, a helping ancestor that then can offer you these teachings um, in terms of you would uh, make that journey, connect with them and ask them those questions um, and then begin to journal and deepen that relationship. I mean, the way that I do it myself is when I've, when I've done those journeys, I'll journey to connect with an ancestral helping spirit. Um, when I meet them, uh, if I have a sense that they're really well in spirit, one of what I call one of the bright and shiny ones, would connect with them, tell them who I am, and ask them, "Are you my grandfather or are you my grandmother?" And if they say yes, I would, <clears throat> I would you know, are you connected to the deeper pool of love and wisdom in our family? And if they say yes, I say, "I would, I would really like to get to know you um, and spend some time with you in this journey realm, um, and I need your help." I need your help to clear all the turmoil, the brokenness, the, uh, the challenge between where you are and where I am in the line. And there's a process of that. Um, I have a friend, I'm gonna go ahead and plug his book because he's, he's written a book called Ancestral Medicine. I think maybe he might even be on this uh, or has been on these before, uh, Daniel Four. And he's written down a process um, of uh, ancestral uh, line clearing, healing work. Um, if you contact me or could, wanted to come visit me, we I could take you through that process. Um, but as far as reading about it in, in great detail, I'd recommend that Daniel's book, uh, Ancestral Medicine. Okay, thank you. Yes, I think this is really important to think about <clears throat> um, going back far enough to speak with the healthy, the bright and shiny <clears throat> ancestors. Right. Because there have been um, certain times when these great woundings mm -hmm. have occurred in our in our civilization, and then there, yeah, that we we carry that forward today, and that's what we're trying. Right, <clears throat> right. It, that those things often come up in divination, or these these places of ancestral turmoil where the story perpetuates itself through the lineage. Right. Um, sometimes there's a an uh, an energy of uh, of unresolved emotion. Um, and sometimes patterning of uh, behaviors and, and things that repeat themselves uh, across generational lines. Um, there's a question from Monique. Could you tell us a little more about how we shall divination and how did you learn to do that? So it's a process I learned from one of my teachers, Meladoma Somme out of West Africa. And um, <clears throat> um, he taught me this process in 2003, when I, and that's when I started doing power shell divinations. Um, if, um, if you go to the website, which is my name, caterbrown.com, and maybe Jocelyn can put it up because it's spelled a little different than it sounds. Um, and click on uh, 2019 retreats. And then at the top of that page, you'll see it says, I receive a, um, a private divination. And you click, click to learn more and it'll give you a page right up. Um, but essentially a calorie shell divination is, is looking at your relationship to your medicine, to your ancestors, to the elemental beings that bring balance and healing. Um, 
looking at things more on the physical plane and on the spiritual plane. Um, and in divination, more than me telling you what I see is uh, not working. What's more important is that at the end of the divination, there are certain ritual prescriptions that come out of it. Um, whether it be to the particular fire ritual, or particular water ritual, or earth ritual, um, that there'll be ritual prescriptions that you then are, are given to do as part of the divination. And often after a period of time, people will check back in like to know, you know like what's happening, what was it effective and what happened because of it. Um, so it's both diagnostic from a um, spiritual point of view and prescriptive in terms of prescribing rituals to address whatever's going on. Okay. Okay, wonderful. And I did put the link here directly to learn more about the Cowrie Shell divination readings. Okay. I can see that. Um, okay. I don't see any more questions posted right now. So if anybody has any more questions for Cater, now is your chance. We have covered some really, really profound information here today. So I know you have questions out there. <laughs> yeah, there's a, um, I think it was Carl Gustav Jung and, and more recently Joanna Macy uh, speaks to that idea of questions. She said, you know, there's, there's, in every life, there's one great question that runs like a thread. And if you find it, you are very fortunate because then, then the life you lead becomes a response to that question. Um, and so, the, you know, the, the idea that may you find a, a question that you can really live into that carries you through your life well. Doesn't have to be that kind of question now, though. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's one not to be answered right here. <laughs> big big question. Yes. Um, I wonder. I have a, I have a question actually. I I wonder. Um, what are your thoughts? You know, I I feel that we are, you know, we're constantly receiving guidance and signs and synchronicities that are trying to point us toward that that thread, mm -hmm. right? That question in our lives, so we right. can. So we can have a chance at following it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so important to respond when those synchronicities happen mm -hmm. or when those opportunities come through that are, you know, that we can mm -hmm. sense are divinely guided. Um, so how can we, in our crazy, hectic world, in our modern world with these, you know, the expectations that are placed upon us to be, to be normal and, you know, all these mm -hmm. things, um, do you have any advice for us on how we can, how we can really tune in and listen and mm -hmm. receive those messages and be able to respond in a good way? All right. So, uh, yeah, be still and um, attune your listening to, you know, asking the question. As a friend of mine says, when you ask for guidance, how long do you really need it to take? It can happen like that. <laughs> Um, and so to, to put out a request for guidance and then really listen, really pay attention what you see, what, how it happens. Um, a very simple exercise is um, if you're somewhere where you can walk in nature um, to ask for guidance on anything and then take a walk and notice everything that happens. It could be a very short walk. It could be a 20-minute walk. Um, if you're not, if you live in a big city where you don't have access to parks or, or nature, you can also ask for guidance and, and put on a, a meditation tape and just journey into nature and, and watch and notice everything you see. And then here's the important part. When you, when you start seeing things or noticing things or information's coming in, the, the first question we tend to ask is, what does that mean? That's not the important question um, because that's, that's kind of spun in, a, in, in language and words, meaning. Uh, what you want to ask is, what action is this guiding me to take today? What action in listening to this, to, to Jocelyn and I talk today, um, what actions are you guided to take having listened to this? Um, 
And it's not so much important that you understand the action. I'm not talking about what to do with your life kind of action. I may be talking about how do you respond when your children to your children when you go home tonight? Or how do you sit with your 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 loved ones differently than maybe you did before? Like what action are you guided to take from having listened to this uh, conversation today? And then if it fits within your integrity to do so, do it. And it doesn't matter if you understand it. Um, and then here's the important thing. Once you do it, pay attention to what happens. Watch what happens next. Um, and you'll know when, you, when you've put yourself on that, uh, in that magical current, that river uh, where things begin to flow, you'll notice things begin to happen. Um, but that's a formula I use is make the, make the request, listen, receive the guidance, ask the question, what action am I guided to take with this, with this experience, and then go do it, even if it doesn't make sense. And again, as long as it fits within your integrity um, to, to do that action, um, follow it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And asking... Mm -hmm. Asking for guidance at the beginning, that's an important step that I think we miss too. You know, we yeah, should. it's a big thing is like help. <laughs> it can be, that, can, that can be the most simplest prayer. You know, the two simple prayers, one that Rumi said is thank you, the other one is help. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then listen, you know, ask and then listen. Listening means watch, notice, pay attention, be still, you know, and, and, and then from that experience, maybe it's a five-minute walk into the nature. Maybe it's, um, you know, you're just walking around your yard and you notice something. Um, then sit with it. Then that, what, what action am I guided to take because of this experience? And then go do that. Okay. And then, again, once you do that, pay attention to what happens next. Okay, wonderful. Um, we have a couple more questions. Are you able to stay on? We're at the hour now, so are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm, I'm happy to hang out here a little bit longer. Okay, great. So Helen is asking, what is the initiatory journey? <clears throat> it, is, um, it is one that you will take, Helen, and that we will all take, and we will do it voluntarily and consciously or involuntarily and accidentally. <laughs> um, the initiatory journey is, um, you know, I was talking about elements earlier, and we can think of the initiatory journeys having two, well, first there's this direction. If you think of life as beginning, uh, generally in our lifetime, we say it begins at birth and ends at death. And so that's life. The initiatory journey is different. It flows opposite life in that it begins with a death and ends with a birth. So that uh, many, many great journeys in life begin with great darkness and great ch challenge and turmoil and separation. And that's the, that's the beginning. That's the, the, the initiatory activating point of the journey that then ends with a birth into something new. Um, so that's a, kind of a big perspective of an initiatory journey. The other is that uh, elementally, I like to talk about journeys as having two kind of two different trajectories. There's an initiatory journey of, of fire or of spirit, and that's one where we get um, activated with some idea, some passion. It's like it takes over and we can't, we can't stop it. We're just, it's got us and we're moving with it. Um, and then there's another initiatory journey that is one of descent and of water. And this is one I call of, of ancestry and, and uh, belonging and memory and, and healing. And that initiatory journey takes us down into water. And that process is one of remembering and healing and belonging, um, a lot of ancestral work. Um, so they can look a little different, these initiatory journeys. Um, but, uh, but the bigger thing is they begin with a loss or death and end with a birth with something new. 
And I think we're as on a, as a planet, we're in that initiatory, uh, the the uh, the alchemist fire. You know, um, it's happening to us. I think it's a. I think Sandra Ingerman said uh, this quote. It, it's said and it goes that um, if you thought you were going to survive, then it wouldn't be an initiation. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. This. That's true. There's usually there's some mystery. Um, there's unpredictability. It's like when we talk about ritual, is we have this word we call it. There's status ritual and then there's radical ritual. Status ritual is kind of like predictable. Like say you go to church and everything happens the same way. In radical ritual, there's this there's a structured beginning and then we're in it and what happens in there we don't really know what's going to happen. There's some some structure, but really what happens is unknown, and that's the mystery. Um, and then there's the you know the coming out the other side. But truly, in an in initiation, uh, like with the vision quest, the the Lakota have that word hemblecha means to cry for a vision. And what that really says is it puts you in a place where you cannot get through this experience by your own willpower. You're going to have to cry out for something greater than you to bring you through this. Um, people can go through rites of passages and not experience an initiation, not reach that point uh, that you surrender so deeply uh, to something greater than yourself that spring simply shows up because you let go enough, you know, and for no other reason. That 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 deep letting go, um, and that that uh, that breaking down of the ego and, and of the of, of everything, and then something shifts. Um, that's why I say it. The either uh, life will take us through initiatory experiences through accidents and illnesses and things. And maybe we do have that. Um, and then we can, um, you know, if you're crazy enough, then you simply just sign up for one. <laughs> and say, I volunteer to volunteer to be dismantled and, and, uh, and broken, broken apart. Yeah. Yeah. We need that. Mm -hmm. We do. Yeah. So we have a hand raised here from Ibtisam. So Ibtisam, let me bring you over. Ibtisam. <laughs> I know this one. A familiar face. Yes. Hi, Ibtisam. Welcome. Good to see you. Good to see you. It's been a while since uh, the highlands of Scotland, roaming around there in the, with the sheep. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you said, some people are crazy enough to sign up. Yes, um, yeah, there, are, there are those people. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's good to see you and hear this. And uh, But it, it's again, the, you know, in self-synchronicities, it was just the point where I touched the icon to raise my hand. That's when you did this. And I'm like, this is amazing how these synchronicities just constantly are popping up. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one. And my question, actually, before I kind of transgress, you know, when I quit with the medicine and what happened with it's 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 I'm okay with the not knowing and you know I know things are flowing and just be guided one step at a time uh, with my uh, I just say the symbolic connection with the umbilical cord and you know but I, I clearly like what you were just mentioning to uh, Helen uh, the descent is now in water um, and you've just affirmed that because I'm, I'm getting this water thing so I know I'm being guided in that direction the, the mm -hmm. water to the water realm uh, my question is, is it okay to, um, to speak about it, to, to, to speak to, or like you, you even name the confusion or ask for guidance and, or is it just better to, to stay with that within yourself and that, let it just come to you, like. I think, like you know, a lot of people talking about energetics. Like, do you think it actually prevents or blocks by asking those questions, uh, whether it's in a forum like this or uh, you know, with a mentor, or just being just just being within and letting it come in time? How how does that work? Um, I think it's completely okay to speak about it um, in terms of the questions and the inquiry. 
and and some people are we could say more hardwired to uncover uh, greater awareness by speaking about it. Um, and the process of communication is, is a is a in and of itself an excavation of deeper material. Where for another person, this going inward and and sitting with um, things and letting them rise up that might be their way. So I wouldn't want to say one is one is uh, the way to do it as opposed to another way, but knowing yourself and, and what way works best for you to, um, to ask those questions, be it in silence or in, in, in conversation. Um, but either way, it's the listening uh, to follow with the, the deeper listening to the response that comes. Thank you. Because, uh, yeah, you've answered. I think for me, both are the ways for me. Like, mm -hmm. not one over the other. I find both work. Brian. So, I guess I have to kind of just do both, navigate the both, yeah. right? Just find, find the one that works for that particular inquiry. But, and it's good to see you again, Kedar. Good after. to see you again. Yeah. Thank you so <laughs> Take much. Take care. Thank you, Intisam. Have a beautiful day. You too, Jasmine. <laughs> <laughs>